<laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. I'm also glad I can't see you. <laughs> it's a lot of people. But OK. Well, I was asked by Bill to talk to you today about Eros and the light of Christ. And many of you may think, what, does, what do these two things have to do with each other? Um, they're not intuitively linked for us theologically, but it's something in the book I'm working on I've been grappling with a lot is this connection between spirituality and sexuality. And today I want to talk a little more broadly than that in terms of eros, which is the root word of eroticism and the light of Christ. So, um, you know, theologically or in our faith tradition, we tend to think of these as polar opposites and, in fact, antithetical to one another. And that, um, in fact, because we think of sexuality as a threat to spirituality, we are often teaching our youth and ourselves to do things such as read the scriptures, go to the temple, uh, sing a hymn, to snuff out sexual feelings. That's how much we sort of culturally think these two pieces don't go together. But I want to talk to you today about why I think they're actually highly related. And the more we develop spiritually, the more we understand the spirituality of sexuality and specifically of eros. So let me just first start by just defining these terms. And you know, what do I mean by the light of Christ? So um, in the church uh, on the website, it says, the light of Christ is the divine energy, power, or influence. Sorry. Uh, the divine energy, power, or influence that proceeds from God through Christ and gives light and life to all things. And so that is to say that the light of Christ is an energy that enlightens us and enlivens us, okay? And so um, I recently listened to a Faith Matters podcast, and they had Ian Morgan Cron on, the, which, who I think is a um, minister, an Episcopal minister, if I remember rightly, and he was speaking about the Enneagram. But one of the things he said in the podcast is that Christianity is an enlightenment religion. And he said he gets some pushback when he says that because people think that's very Eastern and so on. But he said, of course, Christianity is an enlightenment religion because we are seeking God's light. We are in a dark, difficult world. And what it is to practice faith is to be in pursuit of the light, to be in pursuit of enlightenment, of what is good, of what makes our lives easier in this difficult world full of adversity. And so um, that is what we're about. We're seeking that enlightenment through Christ. What do I mean by eros? OK, so eros comes from Greek mythology. Eros was the Greek god of romantic love. And that is to say, eros is what is at the core of romantic attraction. It's this energy that pulls us outside of ourselves. Now, a lot of philosophers and thinkers have talked a lot about Eros. I just want to focus on three of them. The first is C.S. Lewis. In, in his book, The Four Loves, he talks about Eros love as first and foremost, that while it's romantic love and we connect it to sexuality, first and foremost, it's about the desire to transcend ourselves and move towards a compelling and desirable other. He says, secondarily, it's about being sexual with that person. But when we fall in love, almost always, he says, we we're first want to go on thinking about them all day. OK, yes, we're attracted, but it's not about the sex drive. It's about this desire to be with. Carl Jung talked about it in a similar way, that Eros is this drive for psychic relatedness, that we want to move beyond ourselves into greater wholeness through relationship, right? And so. This is this compelling draw that is within all of us. Now, just to give you some example of this, I want to play you a video clip here of my son playing the piano. Um, when my, I'm not going to share this story with permission, but um, so that video clip, if anyone wants to play it here, there we go. So when my son was 13 years old, he was learning to play the piano, did not like practicing despite lots of encouragement and uh, rules from mom and dad. But one day, a girl moved into school, knew a girl, moved into school, and Elliot shared with her that he played the piano. Okay, she's like, wow, I love that, that's so amazing, I love the piano. 
And he says, well, I'm working on a Bruno Mars song. And she's like, oh my gosh, I love Bruno Mars. I, I'd love to hear you play it someday. Well, I picked Elliot up from school that day. He's beaming, okay, when he tells me the story. <laughs> And he comes home and he practices for hours, okay? That is the power of Eros energy, okay? <laughs> Let's keep this girl around, okay? <laughs> because, you know, this is, we worry about Eros energy in our kids. We worry about that romantic, but that's what gets them out of our basements, okay? <laughs> if parental love were enough, they would not grow into adulthood. It's that Eros energy that pushes us to grow into adulthood, into the adult capacity, into adult capacity, but also the adult capacity to be in relationship with a peer. Okay, similar to this, Plato talks about Eros, but of course he talks about it in a platonic way. That is, he draws away from the sexual and says, we can channel that Eros energy into the drive to be more godly. That is to claim our ideals of learning, of beauty, of creativity, and in doing it, transcend ourselves to become more like our parents in heaven, or divinity, as he put it, to become more, uh, more like divinity in that pursuit to transcend the self. However you relate to the call of Eros, whether that's in romantic pursuit, whether that's in the movement to grow beyond your current self, Eros asks us to grow. It asks us to transcend ourselves, to become better, to become stronger, to become wiser. And so it's the pull of growth. Okay, how then uh, is Eros linked to spirituality or spiritual enlightenment? Right? How are these two linked together? Now, before I talk about this, I want to just talk about an opposite energy which is Thanatos. Thanatos is the Greek god of death. That is the desire to give up, to recoil, to pull into ourselves, to not change, right? Um, it is the refusal to grow. So Eros asks us to submit to the world as it is and to grow into the capacity to handle the world. Thanatos is the demand that the world yield to, the, to our reality as we know it. That's the ego, that's natural man. And it drives hostility, cruelty, hatred, um, sadism, right? It's, it's the um, refusal to, to let go of the ego and grow beyond ourselves. Well, in our spiritual practices, in our faith practices, we can use those practices for either eros ends or thanatos ends, right? A lot of us talk about spiritual experiences in terms of experience that affirms what we already think, that makes us feel secure in who we already are, rather than spiritual practices that call us to move beyond where we are, right? To grow into something stronger. Christ was very critical of Thanatos spirituality, right? He was critical of, um, of our inclination to use our beliefs and our spirituality to feel superior to one another, to judge each other, to demand reassurance, certainty, right? Because that isn't faith, that's fear. That's a refusal to grow. And so he was very critical of the Sadducees and the Pharisees because this is the religion that they practice. It was about control, superiority, hierarchy, better than, not about being in the soul work of loving others. Christ was very clear. That is what our faith is about. That is what the gospel is, is learning to do the difficult work, as Adam talked about today, of love, of loving others, right? This is where we want to love uh, perfectly, but not try to demand that we or others yield to our expectations, to our ego demands. And so, again, Sin happens whenever we refuse to keep growing. This is a quote by, I have to look at this tiny print here, St. Gregory of Nyssa, right? So the refusal to keep growing, because again, natural man likes control, likes certainty, and we want to use our faith often for that purpose. But again, when we use our faith for Eros purposes, it asks us to repent, to change, to evolve. It drives faith, okay? That is to say, we have to move into the uncertainty. And so the Greek god Eros was a daimon. And what that means is 
that Greek god was not fully a god and not fully human. He lived in this in-between space. Now, I want to talk to you about the spirituality of in-between. This is something that Thomas More speaks about a lot and talks about this as liminality. What Thomas More, a Catholic theologian, speaks about is the idea that we, um, spiritual practice is good at bringing us into this liminal space. And what he means by that is that it pulls us outside of our mundane day-to-day -day experience, the ego, into the transcendent, into something between our normal lives and God, into this in-between space. And he describes it as something, I'm paraphrasing here, but where we feel most ourselves and most outside of ourselves when we are in liminal experience or spiritual experience. And Thomas More links this to Eros energy. So for example, I remember as a student, I was studying abroad in Israel, climbing up the mountain with several students. And I remember just being separate from the group and lying on the floor of the earth and looking up into the vast universe and having a liminal experience. I didn't have language for it then, but that is to say, I, could, I felt a security in being anchored to the earth. I felt known by God. I felt that I mattered. And at the same time, I felt that I was so insignificant in comparison to this large, mysterious universe that I had a sense of being anchored, but so much mystery and uncertainty at the same time, known and yet you know, significant and yet insignificant. And that in-between captures so much of what we think about often or often experience in this liminality, in these spiritual experiences that are very, very important for our souls. Uh, when I, in, in my effort to write the book in the Facebook group of people who follow my work, I asked the, the question of the group, could you tell me how you would describe spiritual experiences, and please try not to use some of our typical language of beyond a shadow of a doubt and so on, <laughs> okay? Uh, describe it as best you can without using typical LDS language. So a lot of people wrote how they describe spiritual experience, but just this is one of the, that I think really captures a lot of the responses. She describes spiritual experience as this. I feel as if my soul is expanding beyond my capacity to contain it, and it is connecting with something that transcends space and time. I begin to feel the interconnectedness of all things. It is exultant and expansive, like true freedom. And yes, that captures exactly this liminal in-between experience that's really connected to Eros experience. And Thomas More, again, this is a loose quote of his, but he talks about that we, we need these regular excursions out of the mundane, right, to get a glimpse of the eternal and to remind us who we really are. Now, I hope Faith Matters next year asks me to talk to you about the spirituality of the body, okay? <laughs> it's something that I, I think about a lot. We talk sometimes about how the, we think of the physical sometimes as antithetical to the spiritual, and that is not LDS theology. We think of the body as the impediment to the spiritual, even though, again, that is not LDS theology. And in fact, not only is it not an impediment, I think it's essential to truly being able to, to understand and experience the spiritual. So uh, if you think about it, that you know, so much of the body helps us to know what is real and true. Sometimes our most liminal experiences are in the physical. You climb a mountain, you're dancing. It's uh, last year, Brother Bonner stood up here and asked us to stand up and with our bodies to sing, I'm a child of God. Now, I was just, you know, I was actually needing to leave and I was, I'm like, okay, I'll just stay for this. So I put my hands in the air, sigh it shoulder to shoulder with my brothers and sisters and we sang this very touching, familiar song about I'm a child of God and the use of my body, I couldn't stop crying and everyone around me was crying, right? It's like the meaning was more powerful, more powerful than it would have been if I'd been sitting in a chair passively listening to that familiar song. And so, you know, the body is a powerful way to experience it. And so, um, this was another experience, uh, seeing that someone in the Facebook group wrote, she says, as a choreographer, in moments of free form, I've had times where the movement of my body felt holy, like I was tapping into something not actually mine, older than myself, ancient, some kind of generational, perhaps eternal somatic wisdom. I don't know how else to describe it, right? And so, excuse me, as Socrates says, the body is an instrument of perception. 
And so we experience the spiritual through our bodies. And this can be especially true in intimate, loving sexuality, right? That in meaningful sexuality, many people talk about this as transcendent, spiritual, uh, connected, good for one's soul, that movement into the liminal that anchors oneself, anchors one relation, one's relationship. In fact, loving marital sexuality can really be a marital sacrament and a wonderful one. So here is Rodin's The Kiss. You can see the transcendence, right, the liminality of that sensual experience, that physical embodied experience. You see it in Klimt's The Kiss, right? The surrender into the joy, into the, the, the rich meaning. Bernini in The Ecstasy of St. Teresa makes a very explicit link between the spiritual and the sexual, right? This is where St. Teresa is receiving the Holy Spirit, right? But there is a sensuality and a sexuality even to her expression as she's receiving the power of the Holy Spirit. And so our sexual experience can be deeply spiritual, especially when it's in embrace of life, when it's claiming how precious our beloved is, how precious our lives are, that it can be stepping into the fullness. Um, a lot of people come to me because they, have, they don't have eros energy in their sexual relationship. In fact, they're bored in sex and they can't figure out why the relationship is lacking the passion that it seemed to once have. And this is usually because the relationship, and we do this very easily in our marriages, is it starts to become devoid of anything vulnerable, devoid of anything authentic and real, and it starts to be filled with resentment and pretense and management of one another. It's not embracing the vulnerability. Now, some of you out there might say, well, I'm all about Eros energy. I'm really good at it. just wish my partner would get it together on their embrace of Eros energy. But I want to question if that's really true, because Eros is not the same thing as liking sex or liking sexual energy. Eros is the willingness to love wholeheartedly, to be vulnerable in the presence of the other, no pretense, to bring yourself naked, psychologically, literally, right, and really love another. That takes a lot of courage. Eros takes courage. It's an act of faith. It's an embrace of life. It's, it's, it's daring. I mean, we all want to be loved like that. We all want to be loved wholeheartedly. Very few of us want to love ourselves in this way. We want, don't want to extend ourselves in this way. And so many of us relate to marriage and sexuality and hoping to get something right, to secure something in that Thanatos way, rather than having the courage to step into the uncertainty and to love with our whole hearts. That takes faith and that takes courage. And it can be, that is what makes sex intimate and spiritual. Um, so Eros is not about different body positions. It's not about fantasy, right? It's about being awake and alive to the life, to, to life and to your beloved. Um, just to underscore this point, there is nothing less erotic than a red light district. Sex is everywhere, but it is a place of hopelessness, of despair, of giving up, right? It's not a place of embracing life. So again, eros is not about sex, although it can be an express, sex can express eros. And so living with eros requires courage. It is an act of faith. So I want to show you a movie clip of someone that has deeply shaped my life and who lives in Eros energy. And this is, I want to talk to you about the power of a strong maternal presence in my life, which is my mother. Um, we celebrated her birthday last fall and she turned 90 years old and we made a short documentary film about her that included her 90th birthday party and my mom is a woman who has lived wholeheartedly for all 91 years. She's now 91. Um, she has loved with her whole heart. She has someone that I think has had a hope and courage in life. She grew up in a farm in Idaho, very, very little money, and a sharecropper, 
but she's one who's had a tremendous amount of faith in God and in the good um, and in her children and in the goodness of others. And um, so I want to show you a clip about my mom, like all of us, has gone through periods of great difficulty and loss and despair, but she's not been someone who's been willing to submit to it. She has kept looking for how to keep embracing life as precious and as short as it is. So I want to show you a clip of, of an example of this in my mom's life. When my father became ill, she totally dedicated herself to, um, to trying to help him get better through, through food and love and care. When he died, I just couldn't believe he had died. I'll never forget that moment. And I kept saying to him, honey, keep breathing, keep, keep breathing. And Carolyn was saying, I love you, Dad, I love you, Dad. And he turned his head and he died. And I couldn't believe that he had died because we would always do something else and then he'd be okay for a while. But he died and I stood there and I knew I was alone and that he really was not going to be with me anymore and there was no more fix on anything. We were married 61 years. 61 years we lived together and, and uh, raised the kids and we did everything. You, you live with someone like that and they become a part of your very soul. Good and bad, whatever. I knew Lynn so well, in and out. Now, having the role of, you know, mother of aid and, and kind of being this caretaker for my dad in all ways, and then he was sick and, you know, and, and when he died, I think it was just a real, um, almost like the earth, you know, moved in a way that she had to then ground herself again and, you know, what's my purpose and what's, what am I going to do with the, the years that I have. All I remember is I was mailing a package for Jennifer and John to the FedEx that was right in that little strip mall. I had no purpose in life at that point. I just didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. I had no goals and it was always very different for me. So I just started driving out and I just noticed the Fred Astaire dance studio. And so I walked in there and Sweet Doreen was sitting there at the desk. I walked out of there and I had bought two dance lessons. So it was like, kind of, what have I done? <laughs> there was a lot of times I would go home thinking I couldn't do this. I mean, I, I totally said, I'm not going to do this anymore, Doreen. I just can't do this. I mean, I felt like I had bit off something I really couldn't do. She was very emotional about wanting to do well and put a lot of pressure on herself. So we had a lot of moments where I was talking with her and just making sure that she understands that what she's doing is an accomplishment by itself. You know, you getting out on the dance floor, having the dresses on and doing the dances is exceptional. She's also very, you know, private and doesn't like to be necessarily the center of attention. So um, the dancing kind of pushes her out of her comfort zone. You know, I kind of was always dancing to somebody else's drumbeat. My kids, Lynn, Lynn was a strong person. And so it was almost like the first time in my life I could spread my wings. Happy birthday, Virginia. Happy birthday to you. Come on, push your hands together for us tonight. So, um, I just feel like this evening wouldn't be appropriate unless I stood up and thanked you from the bottom of my heart for your presence here. Because the people in this room are some of the dearest people to me in this whole wide world. So I just thank you for being here tonight. I have just loved the Fred Astaire studio and they are gonna perform for you tonight. And it's just been such a fulfilling thing for me. It's almost odd that it's um, become so meaningful to me, you know. 
So I'm probably the oldest person in their studio and maybe the oldest that will ever come. You have to be prepared because everything's going to be about me. <laughs> I think she's really nervous. She puts a lot of pressure on herself. She wants to do it well and she's been working so hard. I truly really feel very strong about prayer. I feel that you don't pray for something and then think opposite. If I want to do this right and I want to do it the way I want the kids to see me do it, then I can't pray for it and picture me making mistakes. I pray for it and I see myself doing it just the way I'm supposed to. And that attitude and feeling has guided my entire life. So tonight, <laughs> I, I am supposed to follow. Sigue cambiando, navegando un mundo que cambia y sigue cambiando. Dos oruquitas paran el viento mientras se abrazan con sentimiento. Siguen creciendo, no saben cuándo buscar algún rincón. El tiempo sigue cambiando, inseparables son. El tiempo sigue cambiando Ay, oruquitas No se aguanten más Hay que crecer, aparte y volver Hacia adelante seguirás Vienen milagros Vienen crisálidas Hay que partir y construir Su propio futuro Ay, oruquitas No se aguanten más Hay que crecer, aparte She's just really been inspiration for the staff as well as um, the students for her to go out there and start a new hobby, you know, face their fears and um, dancing and, and having a good time. <laughs> okay, I'm trying not to cry. Okay, so that is a woman who knows how to live. <laughs> and she's taught me a lot about how to live. Um, I'm so thankful to her. Because Eros is a way of living, right? It's choosing and embodying a full brightness of hope, right? When despair and giving up tempt us, when our resentment about life not giving us what we want, and humiliating us and humbling us, and yet we step up and we move forward and we grow and we keep expanding ourselves. It's, it's the courage to grow and to tolerate disappointment, setback, uncertainty, right? Just like my mom said, I can't do this, I can't do this, and yet she kept going and she kept trying. So, which is a real, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> So, yeah, it's like, you know, rather than resignation, she's chosen hope so many times, and it's really fundamental to joy. Not only her own joy, because you can see in her face, I don't know if we have the picture, I thought I did, there's a, that picture of her at the end, she's just radiating joy. She's just radiating the happiness, and all the people watching her, there she is, all the people watching her can see that full joy in her face, and there's joy in our faces, both to see her thriving, but it also gives us permission to thrive and to, for her to, 
to spread more good through her courageous living. So um, this is a quote by Elder Maxwell. While weak hope leaves us at the mercy of our moods and events, brightness of hope produces illuminated individual individuals. Their luminosity is seen. Such hope permits us to press forward even when dark clouds oppress. And so uh, I'm grateful for her true belief in God and in goodness, enough to strive, enough to tolerate setback and difficulty, and to really claim her life and loving all of us as well as her husband with her whole heart. So um, my hope is that for all of us that we can claim more Eros energy in our lives, to have sufficient faith in God, in God's goodness, to seek God's light, to seek the light of Christ through the way we live in this uncertain and dark world. And my prayer is that we can love one another wholeheartedly. If you're married, love your spouse with your whole heart, to not waste it, to, to embrace this precious other person that's in your life, sharing this short period of time with you, and to bring more courage and to love wholeheartedly because it's here where our souls expand. It's in doing this that we experience greater joy and have more joy to offer. And I think it's here that we begin to know the God who really loves us. So that's my prayer and hope for all of you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you.